Funding for the Hinckley Report is made possible in part by the George S. and Dolores Story Eccles Foundation and the Cleone Peterson Eccles Endowment Fund. Tonight on the Hinckley Report, Orrin Hash says there is no doubt he will run in 2018. Who else might jump into the race? Are there legitimate contenders? Bernie Sanders is planning a visit to Salt Lake. How will Utahns react to the Come Together and Fight Back tour? And what effect will this have on upcoming elections? How do our elected officials fare compared to their national counterparts? Whose approval ratings have risen and which ones have dropped? And where do Utahns stand on other important issues facing our state? Good evening, and welcome to the Hinckley Report. I'm Morgan Lyoncotti, Associate Director of the Hinckley Institute of Politics. Covering the week, we have Jessica Priest, Assistant Professor of Political Science at Brigham Young University, Lad Egan, reporter with KSL, and Julia Ritchie, reporter with KUER. So let's start our discussion with something that's been dominating the headlines in Utah now for a couple of weeks, whether Senator Orrin Hatch will run for re-election in 2018. And we've seen some mixed messages mm -hmm. from the Senator and from his staff. Julia, you had a conversation with him this week. What did you find? Uh, yeah, it's our favorite parlor game right now in Utah, <laughs> but I spoke with uh, Senator Hatch in Lehigh at an event um, earlier this week. And the official line is, I'm running until I say I'm not running. Um, and I think it was interesting is his spokesman was also also sort of backpedaling a little bit and said that Mitt Romney story where, where Senator Hatch said I would maybe step out of the race if Mitt Romney decided he wanted to run was, was just an offhand comment that it was blown out of proportion. So I, I think we are getting some mixed messages but um, as far as his health goes, Senator Hatch says I'm doing fine. He was speaking at a dietary supplement maker in Lehigh. So, um, you know, he's taking all of his, his holy basil and whatever else is, is, is keeping him um, running until, until he says he's not. So. Well, and Lad, what do you make of all this? He also said there's no question about whether or not he's running, but then he also said, I'm running till I'm not running. So what have your conversations yeah, think, been like? I think there are a lot of caveats there of, of what he's, because he says two years is a long time, but we know that it's not really two years, that there needs to be a decision made here soon. Uh, but he does say, I'm running, but two years is a long time. A lot could happen during that time period. I think he is concerned about his wife's health. If something changed there, she's been so supportive, he says, over these past 40 years, that if there was a reason for him to step aside to, to focus on on her he would do that and also his own health and I do think that other situation of if he feels there's someone else that could step in uh, with his blessing uh, and some people don't like him saying like it's something he can bestow upon someone else but someone that could perhaps keep the same prominence hit the ground running there with the Senate like a Mitt Romney he, he would feel comfortable with that. Right, and with this idea of I'm running until I'm not running, there was some interesting commentary this week from LeVar Webb saying that he's he's in this, you know, to keep some of those contenders at bay, to keep the fundraisers on the sidelines, and we know that he has three and a half million cash on hand. So, Jessica, if there are these other contenders that are waiting in the wings, how do they... I mean, can they even make up with that big of a fundraising head start? Well, you know, you can make up a lot of money if you need to and if you're prominent enough. Um, if you are trying to keep contenders out, then what you want to do is have a huge campaign war chest. And that seems to be part of his strategy. Although, I'm not sure if you're, if you're really trying to keep strong contenders out of the race, I don't know why you have these mixed messages. Mm. That doesn't make sense from a strategic perspective. You're either in or you're out. As soon as you start signaling that you might be out, that's a signal for other people to maybe be in. And so that part is confusing to me. Um, but I guess we'll find out. Another interesting component of these conversations, Jenny Wilson, who's a councilwoman for Salt Lake County, um, has said that Utahns don't like this. It feels like this is being bestowed upon mm -hmm. someone. This is part of a democratic process. It needs to be a democratic process, she said. And she's also said she's seriously considering it, which is very interesting because her father ran against mm -hmm. Senator Hatch in 1982, Ted Wilson. So what do you, I mean, what do you guys think, Utahns, how are they reacting to this? Do they like this idea of maybe Orrin Hatch working with Mitt Romney or John Huntsman, or they, do they want this wider process? I felt that, like the last election was sort of this, um, referendum on dynastic politics. I mean, we saw low energy Jeb Bush drop out very soon in the race and and it was credited to the Bush legacy being somewhat mixed. And then we saw Clinton defeated eventually and a 
huge part of that was that she felt entitled to that position. That's what the Republicans kept attacking her on. So I feel like the American people have sent a strong signal that dynastic politics are, are not but yet we see it happen over and over again in Utah, where we have Huntsman's, we have Romney's. Uh, Romney's son has signaled he might run for governor. Um, so it's, I guess it remains to be seen. And I think Jenny Wilson is very in tune with that. So she's a Salt Lake County Councilwoman, and, and she knows that the momentum of the last year's election was we don't want the establishment around. And she also feels being of a younger generation is a benefit to her, be, being a mother, uh, and and kind of knowing more of what's going on in, in Utah. That's one of her criticisms, is that with, with Hatch being in Washington, D.C. for so long, that, that that's more of, of what he's aware of, not what's happening here at home. And so I think she thinks that will benefit her, that Utahns, there is a segment that wants change, does not want uh, these these same names to keep on circulating and, and be passed around. And, and she did come up with, with that, type of phrase, it was in a press release, that it's not a family heirloom for him to give away, it is for the people of Utah to decide who their senator is. I mean, he, from the polls, he's struggling. And, and lots of people want him to step down and I think they're grateful for his service, um, but see that it's maybe time for some change. And I think she picked up on that and I, she's bright. And I, you know, the problem is, is that when he says things like that, it sounds like he's entitled to the position and entitled to determine who the heir is going to be. And Utahns don't care for entitlements all that much. So I think, <laughs> I think, it's, I think it's, a, it's a problem that he's gonna have to just, discuss and address. Well, and an interesting part of this also is that we, when we're talking about these other possibilities, they're all Republican, but as we saw this week in Kansas, we had the special election for their fourth district to replace Mike Pompeo, who joined the Trump administration. And this is a district that Trump won by 27 points, and they were thinking Republican would run away with it. And the Republicans did win it, but just by seven points. And um, there was some analysis done showing that if that 20 point differential were applied to other districts, we could have over 100 congressional districts in play in 2018. And it was really interesting. Was sort of a reminder of what 2016 felt like when everybody suddenly people were like, wait, Repu reliably Republican Utah is being mm -hmm. talked about because one of the Senate seats they said could be in play was Utah. So are we focusing so much on these Republican candidates and with the current mood, maybe these Democratic candidates could actually be viable here in Utah? <laughs> <laughs> what? Um, you know, I mean, I think there's some interesting things to keep in mind. Certainly, um, President Trump is not currently very popular. Even here in Utah, his 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 popularity ratings are, are remarkably low for a solidly Republican state. Um, but I do think it's worth keeping in mind that this was a special election, and special elections are special. And um, and the particular situation is that the you know the Republican that was running was heavily uh, associated with a very unpopular Governor Brownback, and that didn't help. So it's complicated. I, I'm not sure that I would extrapolate too far, but at the same time, I think it's 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 concerning and um, you know, there, there are coattails. You can ride the coattails of a popular president, but if a president is not popular, that hurts, especially in a midterm election. And I think it does energize Democrats to see that this district in uh, in Kansas reliably conservative, and and in the final days of that campaign, the the National Republican Party had to you know bring in the big guns as they, they saw that that lead was in the single digits. So it, yeah, it, we saw Todd, Tim, or excuse me, Ted Cruz yeah. in the pictures, like every single picture basically. So they had to really pull out all the stops, and so it was surprisingly competitive. And I think that only gets Democrats more energized that these red states are going to become more purple and and that was the main headline throughout the general election here in Utah is that we weren't as reliably Republican as in years past. De Jessica's right that like a lot can happen in the next two years. I mean things can happen in the economy and foreign uh, affairs so we really don't know based on these special elections what's going to happen. We do know though that ma the majority party has always struggled going into a midterm election. It happened to the Democrats in mm -hmm. 2010 after Obamacare passed and the falling out and Democrats lost control of the House and Senate. So, I mean, it's not out of, you know, question that this could happen. Right. And with all of this, very interesting, Bernie Sanders is coming to town. He's, he's going to be holding a rally here next week as part of their Come Together and Fight Back tour. So, 
Julia, you covered this so much during the election. What kind of reception and reaction do they do you think he'll get here I, in Utah? It's fair to say people are still feeling the burn. Um, <laughs> we know that Bernie Sanders won the caucus here by by mm -hmm. big margin, and he remains very popular, not just in Utah, but all over the country. And the DNC, which is really struggling to, to build this grassroots coalition and coalesce this liberal activism into a, a real winning strategy going into the midterms, they want to harness that energy, and they want to bring that more progressive caucus into the into the base because there it, there are these lingering tensions and I talked to Peter Caroon who's the the um, president of the Utah Democratic Party about how you bring in those people who are kind of disaffected they don't necessarily see themselves as traditional Democrats um, and and keep those people excited enough to show up to the polls in two years and so I think this is all the the tour is going to go to nine red and blue states so they're actually focusing on states that they haven't traditionally um, mm -hmm. won and it is their time to seize the moment because as we talk about things can change and, and with Trump taking a stance on, on foreign policy with the airstrike in Syria and then the, the large bomb that was dropped just yesterday, those are new developments that could definitely change what, you know, he has not been popular during his first uh, few months as president, but all that could change if, if he keeps this up in terms of, of Republicans uh, feeling comfortable with his strategy. I think the only thing I would add is that um, if the Democratic Party wants to, you know, to contend in Utah and be strong in Utah, they're going to have to do the hard work of party building. And that means, um, you know, building up supporters who are going to consistently show up to the polls, who are going to knock doors. And it especially means recruiting candidates, recruiting strong candidates to run in races. And there are parts of the state where that happens, but at least down in my part of the state, it's, you know, it's rare that I even have options to choose from on the ballot. So that's the hard work and, and Bernie Sanders can come in and he can fire people up and there can be a rally. But if that isn't translated into concrete electoral strategies, then it's just it's just show. Very interesting. We had a new poll this week um, and it's a national poll but really sort of local. It's this comparison of elected officials and their approval ratings throughout the entire country. So we can see how our elected officials are really stacking up to others. And we saw that Governor Herbert's doing pretty well compared to some of his counterparts. Lad, can you talk about that? Yeah, well, was it eighth or ninth most ninth, right. ninth most yeah. popular uh, governor in the, in the nation? Uh, I, I don't think that's surprising. I think where the surprise was that our senators were very middle of the pack, uh, and that uh, Representative Chaffetz saw some numbers drop. So, so we've got, we, you know, we know our states run well. Uh, people here in Utah, we, we take pride that we have got a great economy right now. Uh, but I think it, the view of what's happening in Washington is where we see those approval ratings dip. So Jessica, how do they deal with that? I mean, if this is this issue of we like our statewide, we like our, we're fine with how Utah's being run, but we have this severe dislike of Washington, even if it is the people that we elected. How do those officials deal with that? Well, I mean, one thing is they could spend more time in the state, you know, I mean, and, 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 and hold more town halls, more town halls <laughs> which what was it, 90 something percent of Utah say we want to see our senators and our representatives holding town halls. And it's, it's very dangerous. I mean, there's a lot to do in DC. It's very busy. It's a big job, lots of policy, lots of committee work, um, but it is dangerous if you're not spending, you know, in political science we call it your home style, right? Like what are you doing back at home to, to make sure that you're keeping those connections solid? And, 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 and so if I were, you know, if I were advising them, I'd say you should be spending more time back home and, 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 and making sure that you don't get painted in with the rest of the Washington crowd. Yeah. Uh, and I, Representative Mia Love was at the same event with Senator um, Hatch, and she was she's very reticent to talk to press. I did ask her political director if she planned on holding a town hall, and she doesn't. And and keep in mind we're on a two-week congressional break right now for Easter, and none of our elected representatives are holding town halls so far this year. We've only had two in-person town halls: one with Congressman Stewart and another with Congressman Chaffetz. It's it's not comfortable right now because there is this energy among the left. They're showing up to these things. They're yelling and they're screaming and they're, sh they're showing their dissatisfaction. But it also doesn't help that uh, I think within that poll we saw that the more closely um, 
specific members of the delegation have aligned themselves with President Trump, particularly Chaffetz recently, um, and even Senator Hatch is very closely aligned. Um, they're doing poor, more poorly <laughs> in their favorability ratings, whereas someone like Governor Herbert, who has done better at like distancing himself from the chaos of Washington, has, has performed better. So that's something to keep in mind, too. Right. I'm so glad that you mentioned town halls because this is an issue and there have been calls, Utah Indivisible is trying to make calls for Mia Love to hold a town hall. And we see that well over 90% of Utahns want town halls. So it's not just this democratic or this um, this far left issue. Um, but this is hard. Uh, I think Senator Dean Heller from Nevada is holding a town hall, which is where you lived recently. <laughs> and he was quoted as saying, this is not going to be fun. It's going to be two hours of yelling, but it's one of those boxes that you have to check. So is this just part of the package deal now for them? Yes, it is. <laughs> I mean, you know, every job has stuff that's uncomfortable that you don't like to do. And if you want the rest of the job, you've got to do that too. I mean, Senator Flake had a had a town hall last night, I believe, that um, was two hours long. And there were lots of angry people. But, you know, he stayed afterwards and continued to talk with, uh, with constituents who are upset. And, you know, if you're going to sign up to be a politician, you're not going to be popular all the time. You're going to, you're going to do stuff that ticks people off and you've got to be accountable and willing to take responsibility for that and, and fess up, right? And 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 then it and, and the other part of that is it gives you an opportunity to explain to people why you did what you did. And 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 so it is very perplexing and, and disturbing, honestly, that um, that they're unwilling to come and, and talk with their constituents. And I think the Republican lawmakers maybe we'll get more savvy in terms of, of the organizing of these town hall meetings. Because we know, especially with Chaffetz, where we saw a large segment show up, you know, maybe they spread the word on social media, however they did that, and it, obviously that's their right to show up, even though afterward uh, the headlines were made that he said it was paid protesters. <laughs> and, and he did tell our organization that he felt that that comment was blown out of proportion, that he didn't mean all of them were paid, but mm -hmm. that he felt like there was there was a segment there. But if there's organizing on the other side as well, if, if they want to get their supporters there, nothing stopping them from getting their supporters to also come to the town hall meeting and and that way they if they want a more balanced audience they can they can uh, send out the word as well yeah and Julia, again, any I final mean, thoughts I on this one? I think you're going to see if they're going to hold public forums, they're going to be in more friendly parts of the state at this point. Right. I mean, if any time you hold something in Salt Lake, you're going to bring a contingent of uh, disaffected Democrats and liberal activists out who don't feel like they have representation in Washington right now. Um, so that's that's part of the deal, too, because that's the way uh, we've divided our district to include, to basically divide Salt Lake into a pie. Um, so the, like you said, that's their right to organize and show up to these things and, and show their, their dissatisfaction. Right. I would love for Representative Chaffetz to come down and do something in Provo. I think there are yeah. lots of people in Provo that would like to see him. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, hopefully he watches the show. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> I think the pressure will stay on Mia Love yes. to, yeah. to hold a town hall meeting. Oh, for sure. So. Yeah. So a pre perennial issue in Utah, women in politics. We struggle getting women to run. We struggle getting them elected. Um, Jessica, you've done a lot of research on this, and we have organizations that have whose mission it is to recruit, to train women so that they can run. Real Women Run, Women's Leadership Institute, um, and they're seeing a big uptick in the numbers of women that are coming to their trainings. They're holding trainings outside of Salt Lake City. So Jessica, tell us a little bit what your research has shown, why women are usually reticent to get involved, and why they're now willing to maybe jump over some of those barriers. So I think it's, I mean, it's a complex thing, right? Like uh, trying to parse out why exactly women are reticent to run for office. It, it involves a lot of different factors. Um, but I would say, especially in Utah, I think something that we mentioned before, which is in general, people like the way the state is being run. They're happy with the economy. They're, you know, they, they, they like Governor Herbert and, 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 and whatnot. Um, and so as, as long as things are going pretty well, you may say, oh, I don't really need to get involved and, and that's not what I need to do. Um, when things start going downhill or there, there are things that you don't like going on, that is highly motivating. But, but if we're, if we're going to look, if we're going to zoom out sort of more broadly, um, one of the biggest reasons that women don't run for office is because they're not recruited to run. And they're not part of the social networks or the party networks um, where people are saying, hey, have you ever thought that maybe you should go run? And, and that, um, that means that they don't get asked. And it turns out that women need to be asked 
to run and they're much more likely to run if they're asked so that's you know I think that's going on in Utah as well as the sort of suddenly people are feeling very frustrated with what's going on yeah, I was going to say a positive sign is that right now in at least three of our four districts, we have a, a progressive or Democratic female candidate who has signaled the, their intention to run. So we have Dr. Kathy Allen, who's going to be challenging uh, Jason Chaffetz in the third district. We have uh, Darlene McDonald announced this week she's going to be running against Mia Love uh, if she can get enough money. Um, and then we have uh, Misty Snow, who's running against Stewart, and she announced this week. So we do see that energy starting to galvanize and for some reason it's it's really resonated with women especially on the left and so they are throwing their name in the ring whether they'll be competitive or not there are a number of other factors that will contribute to that. And I think there are a lot of positive signs as well. And I wonder if politics is lagging a little bit behind what we're seeing in business in Utah. Because in business in Utah, uh, there, there are many more women leaders. Uh, this past week, I attended a, a luncheon for the Girl Scouts of Utah. And uh, Crystal Magalette, who uh, is the CEO of Flying J and Maverick, gave a, a wonderful presentation to the Girl Scouts there, talking about all the opportunities there in business and, the, and, and other groups there that, that monitor how many women are involved in leadership role say that this is a great time for women in business so hopefully that will also spill over into politics I think with key issues like education and other things that where you talk about Jessica where women want to be involved want to make a difference I think as we see our population growing and, uh, and other issues that women want to be involved in then we should see more uh, in politics yeah and I, I mean I think the key point is that uh, Utah is always going to be low on uh, female representatives so long as the Republican Party lags Democratic Party in its recruitment and retention of, of female candidates and and um, you know we that's something that has to be talked about and I and there are good people talking about it I had lunch the other day with uh, Nyla McBain who is working hard and, and got a grant from our legislature to be trying to work on some of these issues of, of bringing more women into both the business side and into politics and um, so there are good things happening but it's slow it's that hard work of getting candidates to run for every city council seat and every school board and every county commission and then every legislative seat Those that's, that's hard work. It is, and we see it across the board. We, we talk about sometimes how the PTA is a slippery slope into entering politics <laughs> in a lot of places in the country, but not necessarily Utah. If those women aren't running for city council, then they're not going to run for legislature and so on yeah. and so forth. Speaking of the PTA, so we've got some school districts in the state doing some unique things. We're, we've been struggling with retaining teachers. We have a lot of teachers that are retiring. And we saw Granite um, School District announced this week, um, sort of following Jordan and Canyon saying that, hey, we're finding new ways to pay our teachers and Granite's going to be increasing property taxes. So what do you guys make of this? How are there, how are these school, you know, how are the people in these school districts going to react? I think because of our schools now, I think they got this ball rolling right. that we want to focus on education. We know our legislature did do some, not as much as the group our schools now says we need. They want the number like $750 million new dollars right. pumped into education through an increase in the income tax. And we know our lawmakers did not want that passed uh, by a, a voter initiative because they say that that ties their hands. But now you see that the districts uh, are, are going at it their own way. Uh, Jordan School District has some reserves and they're going to give an increase through that. But then Granite didn't have those reserves, so now they're, they're looking to property taxes. Uh, and it remains to be seen if the residents feel comfortable comfortable with that if it does retain teachers and that does affect families. And some of these incentives, our education reporter has done more on this, but um, they're, they're targeted at attracting new teachers, right? Because we need new teachers and we need to pay them enough to be, even want to enter the, the career field. But sometimes that has an effect of penalizing the teachers that have mm. been there already for several years. And that, you just mentioned, re retentionship is a big issue. So sometimes when, when we create these new incentives to hire new teachers, we end up forgetting about the teachers that have been slogging through at the same pay grade for year after year, and, and what did they get out of this? And they actually will get capped at a certain point in yeah. some of the districts where, where they, they can't earn more. Yeah, so there is, there is a, a bit of a downside as, as far as like you, you give money to one pool of people and then it kind of draws from another pool. And what do you guys make of the districts just taking this into our, their own hands? We struggle with this at the federal level, at the state level. They're always trying to figure out how to fund education. And we're even seeing reports of schools recruiting nationwide to try to get teachers. So is this about the school districts just saying, we will figure this out on our own? 
I think especially in parts of Salt Lake or, or Utah County that is growing, like in Utah County, Lehigh, Alpine School District, here in, in the Salt Lake Valley out uh, where it's growing in South Jordan, I think the districts feel like they just have to do something. And the parents want their schools run well, they want enough teachers, and so I think they're, they're, that's why they are taking it into their own hands. I think yeah, you see voters doing the same thing by creating a ballot initiative. Those are parents of, sc of school children who are tired of seeing you know, their, their kids not having space to practice in band and things like that. So that's why you're seeing these voter-driven sort of bottom-up sort of initiatives. Okay. And with the last few moments that we have in the show, interesting things with Donald Trump's favorability here in Utah. A few weeks ago, it was above 50%. Healthcare legislation didn't happen and it dropped again. But since then, we've seen Neil Gorsuch's confirmation and swearing in, which was a huge deal for voters in Utah. And we've also seen these military strikes. So what do you guys think is going to be happening with his favorabilities here in the state? It's gonna be a tough, uh, it's a tough battle for him in this state, um, and, and and sometimes you can get a, a favorability boost by military strikes, but those tend to be really short-lived. I mean, you think about, uh, you know, Obama takes down uh, Osama bin Laden, and you know that helps him for a little while, mm -hmm. but then we're you know we're back to normal. And partisanship is powerful, but in Donald Trump's particular case, he's not getting the full benefit of that. So, okay, well, that will have to be the last word on that. Thank you so much to this wonderful panel. That's it for the Hinckley Report. Our conversation continues online as we discuss trust in media and the Tribune's Pulitzer Prize. Go to KUED.org slash Hinckley Report for more of our panel discussion. Thank you for joining us. Good night.